anytime one of those words has, has got a capital letter at the front of it, lean, capital L, agile, capital A, product, capital P, digital, capital D, as soon as something gets a capital letter, it's dying. Welcome to The Thinking Leader, brought to you by Red Team Thinking. Bad leaders react, good leaders plan, and great leaders think. Each week, you'll get new ideas and insights from business executives, military experts, and innovative thought leaders to help you lead more effectively and better navigate your complex world. Now, here are your hosts, best-selling business author and top-rated leadership speaker, Bryce Hoffman, and former RAF Wing Commander and Business Agility Coach, Marcus Dimbleby. Hello and welcome to the show. Marcus, my friend, who do we have with us this week? Good day, Bryce. Great to see you. And this week, who do we have? We have a very good friend of mine, Richard James, on the show. Richard is a well-known thought leader and operator in the world of agile and ways of working. He spent over eight years leading nationwide through one of their transformations. And prior to that, he worked at Accenture for many years. And now he's gone back to Accenture as a managing director. But we won't hold that against him. Richard, it's great to have you on the show. And I'm really looking forward to this discussion. Excellent. Welcome, Richard. Really, really, really nice to be here. Thank you, gents. Uh, yeah, long time listener, first time caller. Thank you for your time. And <laughs> looking forward to the conversation. No, it's great. So, Richard, you know, you started off at Accenture over 10 years ago. You had a, a, an expansive career there. And then you left from there and went into nationwide building society. So, you know, the retail banking world of the UK. How was that when you first arrived? I think it's. Um, so, yeah, I, I've been in the technology and, and change industry since then 2000. Um, and my first 10 plus years um, with Accenture was a, a really good lesson in, in coming together and doing really quite complicated systems integration work, working with really diverse clients um, uh, across different industries, across different geographies. And this was in a period of 2000 to 2010 where offshoring was beginning to be a, a much more so sort of prevalent part of the consulting organization's um, approach. And so for 2000 to, to, to 2000 and, yeah, 2014, with my, my career first time around with Accenture, that large scale, quite heavily offshore um, leverage work um, and doing the, what, what we would class as complicated, really big, ugly, multi, multi sort of system pieces, you've formed firm friends. So I'm back in the building where I started actually right now, having come back to Accenture and, and you know, the building still feels very similar to me, but in that sort of eight year period where I was away in industry, um, yeah, the world has changed so much just in terms of what, what organizations are seeking to achieve, um, crucially how they show up, how they work together, the, the, the role of leadership, the role of management, um, uh, and for me, the, the eight years with Nationwide, I hugely enjoyed and I was deeply appreciative and respectful for the chance to take in the industry side of the sort of consulting and support journey that you're, you're offering from, from Accenture or the consulting organization. Uh, and the learnings for me, a lot more about humility, vulnerability, ha how to engage, connect, transformational leadership in industry needing to be really dialed up to support your industry challenges whereas in the consulting world you're asked to come in and solve a problem and actually you've got a remit to, to do a specific thing industry side um, much longer term commitments to people's longer term careers and growth um, and different 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 folks from different backgrounds industry side over in West Wiltshire in the UK versus a consulting industry multinationally Philippines India UK um, I, I've had a really lovely time actually across the two different types of work and the two different sizes and scales of organizations. You mentioned two words, a uh, humility and vulnerability. And, you know, I'll blow some sunshine here. You are recognized as one of the successful agile leaders, if you will, with the work that you did at Nationwide. I, I remember we first met at some conference, you were there at a, a pizza and beer night being hosted in London, and you came along and gave a great presentation and we met afterwards. And, you know, your success story was very well revered by everybody, you know, you were sought after for how did you enable that to happen in such a large organization where everybody else was struggling? And, and I think those two key words that you said, this humility and vulnerability, 
focusing on that and focusing on the people elements of that was one of your key strengths. And that's certainly what I felt having met you and listened to you. That, that, um, Hey, I appreciate it. I like, um, certainly the, the, the period with nationwide coincided with, um, a fascinating uh, journey for them. So large scale outsourcing in the sort of mid 2005 through to about 2014, 15. Um, and I transitioned from Accenture to Nationwide um, as a permanent employee in what was the transformation business. Um, so that is you sort of inside the organization, you have the business areas and then a department dedicated to transforming large scale change. Again, this is almost an internal consulting organization within, within a building society bank, banking player. Um, and, and how do you go about leading large scale transformational change in industry? Well, I think you have to appreciate and respect the operational responsibilities of the business colleagues that you're serving. So you have to meet them where they are. You have to think about the, the scale of regulatory change or innovative change that they're, they're wrestling with. And I think you, you sort of, that journey with Nationwide starts from a sort of a position of needing to be respectful, needing to be humble and, and say, look, I can, I can bring you um, capabilities that will afford you uh, you know, new operational effectiveness or, or totally new um, channels or propositions. But for you as the operational leader who's then got to wield those in service of, of Nationwide's members or customers in the business, um, yeah, this is, this is quite scary. This is, this is a challenge for you. So I think the sort of vulnerability and humility piece is, is just being respectful of others as much as anything else. The, the, the change journey you can build whatever you want, but the, the cultural change, the behavioral change, the ability to consume it, use it for the service of, of the business and the customers or the members um, is much more for me the, 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 the exciting part and the, the unlock. You know, the, the technology, when we, I think when we first met, we were having the conversation about um, technology is easy, which technology is not easy, but, but the pitch was technology is easy, culture is hard, mm -hmm. and, and really all factors around um, how to support and nurture a culture of um, you know, experimentation, learning, a culture where leaders are vulnerable and considerate and um, open about the learning journey they're on individually and collectively. So, so I, I think for me, the, the respect for maybe our story was, was as much actually a reflection of leadership in general rather than of any sort of specific individual. You know, it's not me. I think it represents the organization we were, we were working with at that point. I'd also say, I think the building society movement, if I think building societies are owned by their members. Mm -hmm. So a building society, yes, it's in the retail banking industry, but actually there's a really lovely um, sense of, of you're there to support the members of today and tomorrow with a service that meets their needs now and, and in future. And actually that, that sense of being so directly connected to the end customer or, or, or member for a nationwide as a building society, again, drives up a sense of connectedness um, and, and, and passion towards what the, what the customer member is trying to achieve. So I think, yeah, maybe that, that also drives some behaviors. I have to jump in here as the, as, as the ignorant yank. What is a building ah, society? Okay, so building society, fascinating <laughs> history, right? So um, yeah. Building society, similar similar to mutual organizations. So these are organizations that are owned by their member base. Um, so over in the, the UK, uh, the Building Society Association um, has a raft of small small building societies in terms of being almost quite local, geographic, um, mm -hmm. geographically specific, like Bath Building Society or, or Cheshire Building Society or Leeds Building Society, Yorkshire Building Society, My Nationwide first. Building yeah. Society. There you go. So, like, and all of us have probably had. So, it. is it like a is it like a credit union? Yeah, in the United si States? similar to credit unions in the sense that then okay. what we're having here is that the money that is loaned is then as a result mm -hmm. of savings that are accrued organizationally. Right. And so that's yeah. So it's like a credit union yeah. in the United States. Uh, and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Interesting. Nationwide as a building society is then a, a, a merger over time. It started as National Provident. It was then combined with Anglia and combined. And that's sort of over time you have it for the UK. So it does what it says on the tin. It's the, it's the nationwide. Yeah. And that, that was the strap line for that period. The, the yeah. job of nationwide <laughs> under a CEO at the time was building society nationwide. Nationwide building society. So it's building interesting. Society nationwide. Brilliant, right? That. Thank you for 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 cluing me in on this and for for cluing in our our listeners on this side of of the Atlantic as well. Um, I'm going to steal Marcus's tagline here, and, and you know which which I think is so apt, which is that that new ways of working don't work with old ways of thinking. And I think that gets into the the cultural issue that that you're talking about, Richard, which is that 
you know, you're not just changing the way people do their jobs. If you're doing this right, you're changing the way they think about their jobs. Yeah. And indeed the way they think, period. Yeah. And that's not easy. And it's important, you know, this is something that we deal with in our in our business all the time is is having a bit of sympathy for people. Recognizing particularly when we're working, you know, this is, you know, really true when we're working with private clients rather than doing training, you know, for 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 people who want to be learning our tools yep. and techniques. Yep. But when we come into an organization is to, is to have the sensitivity and, and particularly for senior leadership that that this is hard. You know, one of the things that we do with a lot of our private clients is we kick an organ kick things off with with playing a game we call lies we tell ourselves that that gets into just that. What are some of the lies we tell ourselves as an organization? You know, that that gets real very quickly. Brutal, isn't it? <laughs> and you know, it's it's easy to 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 be glib about it, but you have to have, you know, and I'm always amazed at the willingness of leaders to do this, yeah, to, 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 to have that discussion with their teams. But you have to have a lot of empathy and a lot of sympathy for them because, you know, it's not easy to hear the truth if you haven't been hearing it, if no one's been telling you, particularly for years or maybe your whole career, and now they're going to, that can, that can be difficult. That, um, for, for us, um, over the later part of the nationwide journey, um, I was very fortunate actually to work for an incredibly enlightened chief operating officer, uh, that Patrick, uh, Patrick Eltridge. Yeah. yeah. Great guy. Um, and, um, yeah, he invested internally in, in something that we called a ways of working center of enablement. Um, and we put real focus on culture and we put real focus on supporting, um, areas of the organization. So either leaders, teams, preferably teams and leaders working together, um, on, yeah, the topics of psychological safety and then um, Arbinger's outward mindset. So we did mm -hmm. have yep. some pretty substantial in-house accredited training that, that allowed us to engage with um, individuals so that they could learn content, but ideally extant cross-functional teams who were starting to work together so that we could really deliberately address mindset, address um, that, that, understanding of psychological safety meaning not not being nice to each other but but having that you know low fear of interpersonal risk and, and that sense of being able to be open it's, it's not quite at the radical candor end of the conversation but but for uk folk the getting towards radical candor um and when i look at you when i look at kim scott and amy evanson sort of coming together with that so we, we did we were, we were using that type of content to suggest yeah. to um teams coming together for maybe the first time who'd been in role-based silos and had a project management machine that sort of did the handoffs. Actually, now we're seeing these teams come together, um, you know, in, in value stream oriented ways of working with, with teams who are um, needing to find a common language and a, and a sort of common belief. And, and actually for a building society, the common belief system is really easy. It's not shareholder, it's, it's, it is member. So that sense right. of it, I think a building society has a really easy leg up in, in the sense of you're, you're really quite viscerally and directly connected to member, member value. But the culture and a culture where people feel safe to speak as they speak as they find to have an inclusive environment where diverse points of view are welcomed. Yeah, I, I, I 100 percent back that, that, that actually that the, I am forever grateful for the, the, the bravery, the empathy, the humility of the leaders we were working with to to engage in that so willingly, so openly and so vulnerably. And that's what and that, you know, like for everything. That, that's it. Right. That's not it's nothing. It's nothing about the individual evolved i think organization is a great culture but just just as you said that that list of great words and phrases that sum up the leadership you know when we look at the business agility institute every year they smash out these great reports you know the state of agile and i think pretty much every year it's been the number one challenge to agile slash digital slash you know big scale transformations is leadership yeah. and it goes back to exactly what you just said because leadership isn't being brave, isn't being supportive, isn't being sympathetic. It's still, going off Bryce's riff off of my phrase, it's still sat in the last century's ways of thinking more often than not. And again, I have sympathy with that. I often you know, work with teams and the first thing you talk to the teams about, what's the problem? And they all point upstairs, don't they? Everyone looks upwards and goes, oh, bloody <laughs> leadership. You know? yeah. And you go and talk to leadership yeah. and they go, bloody teams down below. And, you've, and, I, and I really help people see each other's perspectives 
Because when you look at what the leadership, when we talk about leadership, you know, the executives upstairs dealing with this in this in this very complex world that we've been almost thrust into at pace, and they've not kept up because we know that the internal learning and development programs that you know are on are on the books don't really provide the support most organisations and individuals within need. So I think it goes back to this, you know, humility and vulnerability, this understanding of not just yourself and where you are at your peer group and level, but understanding what your leaders are facing into and going through and, and then how you can both help each other. And that sympathetic ear of where you both sit allows you to come together rather than becoming more polarized, which is what we see often the problems and why these transformations fail when you go in and do the after action and, you know, the post-mortem you see that they are polar opposites within the organization rather than being a focused team going forward as one. And, you know, let, let's, you let, let, let's touch on that, the, the, the sense of um, what's measured as well. So you, you, we, we then think about, um, <clears throat> particularly when we're asking, particularly when we're asking folks to work together who, who historically, um, it's not necessarily that they've been adversarial, but they've certainly been tribal. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we could call it dev and ops, or you could call it biz and dev, you could call it whatever you, yeah. It, yeah. <laughs> and they, they've got tribal affiliation to a you know, departmental or silo leader, typically then um, heavily mired in processes and uh, controls and assurance and finances and rewards mechanisms and tooling that reinforces the stovepipe. So, even the sense of just trying to get two people on on in the same building on two different floors who who don't share a, a, again a lingua franca mm -hmm. the, 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 it's it's an incredible journey to observe folk being able to find something that they can share in common and then we can play with the idea that smaller teams can come to grips with this more easily and smaller teams being working together over a prolonged period um we can get into Dunbar numbers and we can get into the, we know that there's a sociological angle to it that says smaller teams are able to form relationships and with care, nurture and support, education and sympathy and empathy, actually you can, you can break down this historic, what were we measured on? Absolutely. How did we reinforce? What was the control mechanisms? What the heavyweight processes? Uh, and that's, a, I think a sort of almost a positive antivirus, actually, that the, the, how do you start to, to put in an antidote for, um, the the yeah you know, the factory tailor models and whatever whatever I I guess the, the the other thing to say about it though is I I am considerate of uh, the sort of over agilista language so the the, the you know, Frederick Winslow Taylor um, Weber um, mass industry it had its role in the industrial period and it still has a role mm -hmm. today. And I think the 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 oversimplification that says everyone is now, you know, super digital and and super agile or whatever you want to call it, without respect for the fact that there's operational rigor, stability, efficiency, and exploration, and um, you know, an ability to 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 move between the two, rather than a one thing is bad, one thing is good, and you're now bad because this is what you learned and this is, this is how you've been brought. I just don't think it is that. But, it, but isn't that the crux of the problem, though, with the world of Agile? It, it, it has really, yeah. as we were joking about polarizing people within, Agile itself, yeah. big A, has polarized this, as you said, waterfall bad, old school type stuff. Oh, those who do that, project managers, go away, not needed anymore. Middle management, ugh. everything now, as you said, it's the Agilista viewpoint which has almost now become a self-fulfilling prophecy of eating itself because it's going down this spiral of people now being almost anti-agile and moving away. And even the agilists who were you know, in their prime are moving away from saying, yeah. just, just stop talking about it. And before this moment, you've not even used the word. The words you've been using I, I, has been I, about I, people, interactions and relationships. Yeah. I, I really find any time one of those words has, has got a capital letter at the front of it, lean capital L, yeah. Agile, capital A, Product, capital P, Digital, capital D, DevOps, maybe, maybe somebody, but, but these, as soon as something gets a capital letter, it's dying. Yes. Because you know that the capital letter means it's an industry. It's got, yeah, yeah basically absolutely. capital letter means trademark. And trademark means machine and, uh, and yeah, industrialized. Yeah, sell, sell, sell. And I, I'm really, I'm really conscious of, of those words. And you sort of, I, but my personal favorite at the moment is flow. But flow, 
we'll, I'm sure Flow will get capitalized. And in fact, I, like we know the names actually. We, we know folks Absolutely. who are in the Flow we'll and will make business. it a capital F. Yeah. And you just think, oh, their marks, their marks probably the beginning of the, the beginning the of the end. Um, about to come in the coffin, isn't it? Yeah. And, and yeah, ultimately at the, at the root of all of these, at the root of, of Lean, at the root of Agile, um, the idea of um, yeah, j- just, just more conscious decision-making about where we are, um, what style of work suits the terrain or the domain, um, and, and not to geek out again, but the Kinevin approach of sense making yeah. for me. Yeah, I think I think that rather than everything has to be one thing or the other, that sense that it's emergent and emergent properties, and and how do we more artfully, consciously engage in that debate about what is the right approach for the right moment in time? Where, where the moment in time might be as a result of a COVID pandemic changing. Yeah, it's something that was stable. Actually, something external changed things overnight. Um, or it could be uh, macroeconomic changes with Brexit. Or, or it could be uh, modern innovation and cloud. And so, but but the sense that not of your own control, but certainly now around us, things will be changing intradaily, and therefore being much more curious and able to 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 work with the uncertainty and the emergence. That's also quite difficult for large organizations who are built around stability and management in stable times. So, yeah, I, I, I don't like the capital letter words, but I do like some of the some of the core things around empiricism, around you know, approaches that, that that manage risk better in uncertain environments. Let's not label them. Let's just let's just appreciate that, that they're approaches that that s- suit better certain terrains and contexts. Well, this this this. I want to come back to the capital letter words in a sec, but but this being becoming comfortable with ambiguity is, in my mind, an essential skill for every leader in every organization right now. I mean, it's it's <clears throat> you look at the surveys. You know, we 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 often cite the the the, the survey that the World Economic Forum did in 2020 about what are the most important skills you know, in this, in this decade and, and it's applied critical thinking and decision-making, which I a hundred percent agree with, but I think even, even above that or, or, or on parity with that, cause you can't actually, you can't actually navigate uncertainty and ambiguity without those things, but right up there with those is, it should be being comfortable with ambiguity, being comfortable with uncertainty, being comfortable with complexity. And most people aren't. Most people are terrified of these things. And, you know, and and I think most leaders, see, most senior leaders are particularly terrified because they, too many of them want an answer. You know, they'll talk to their teams. There's a problem. There's an issue that the organization is dealing with. What's the answer? And, you know, the reality is, is today, oftentimes the answer is, one thing today, but maybe another thing tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think I, I it, again, it really, really resonates, right? So the sense that there is a best practice, or John Smart, were like, is there one best way? No, there is not one best way. And certainly, we can observe um, common traits, and we can observe anti patterns or patterns. We we can observe these things, and how we sense and adapt in our context, which will be unique on any given day, week, month. Um, I, I guess it is. It, it's uh, this sort of organizational belief in rigidity, stability, and being able to manage, almost manage in stability and rigidity. Um, the name of the community I worked in it, nationwide, the, the name of the community was Resilience and Agility. Oh, and sorry, even the community. So it wasn't a department. I worked in a community where the community's goals were in its, in its name. So we were not the COO function. We were a community of folks dedicated to resilience and agility, almost core and chronic conflict desk mm-hmm. as well. You know, that sort of actually, do you know what? Resilience and agility are, are, are deeply integrated yeah. concepts. Um, and, and even that, that sort of, I think for me, that, that sense that whether you're comfortable with it or not, whether you really enjoy uncertainty, whether you're, whether you're a, um, yeah, like a danger, danger fan who wants to jump off this or do, uh, or whether you're, whether you're tired by it, you, the, the resilience to say this world, this world of 200% record change in every iteration and Gen AI this week, something else last week, something else next week, whether we like it or not, the level of 
instability is something that we must be resilient for personally, mentally, emotionally, connected with others and have the agility and enough curiosity to, to, to go forward mm -hmm. rather than to sort of re-entrench and try and manufacture stability. You like, I can, I can command stability. I, it's really hard to command stability against this backdrop. Well, you know, and this is why the wellspring that I went to, you know, with, with red teaming was the military and intelligence yeah, community brilliant. because brilliant. these are people who have been comfortable for a lot longer than business has with operating in an ambiguous environment. And particularly in the military, in the, in the special forces arena, they taught, you know, it's all about operating in the gray space and things like that. And, and, you know, it's the tools and techniques that these organizations have developed and evolved are designed specifically to navigate uncertain environments where the right answer today may be the wrong answer tomorrow and and where the 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 mission changes as it's being executed and all of this sort of thing and business needs to learn to operate like that too you know and and it's this is something you know i i i go back to to when i was at the command and general staff college and i was taking the red team leader course back in 2015 i i you know i don't have a military background i was you know as a business journalist and i you know, had covered the American automobile industry, the semiconductor industry, the software industry, biotech industry. And I was telling that, the, you know, I, I have lunch every every couple of weeks when I was at the at the school with the commanding general, um, Bob Brown. And I told him, you know, I said, you know, the guys and gal, one, there was one woman in my class, um, ha at least half of these people could walk into a Fortune 50 company and do a better job running a function or running a business unit, I would wager, than half the people that I know doing those jobs. Who've been doing it for 30 today. years. Because they are, they are better leaders. They are much more comfortable making decisions under ambiguity. They aren't bothered by the fact that they don't know things because they know how to how to assemble teams to give them the answers and they trust those people. And, you know, it's like, you know, it, it, it it's, if, if you want an example of an agile leader, talk to someone who's, who's been a Delta force commander. One of my classmates was, you know, I mean, these are, these are 12 person teams where, where rank has very little meaning because, you know, um, at, other than as the ultimate ar arbiter when a decision, you know, when there's a disagreement or something. And these are people who are comfortable listening to the most junior person on their team if they have something valid to share. They're comfortable weighing evidence. They're comfortable challenging their assumptions. They're comfortable changing their 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 course of action midstream rather than doubling down on something that's not working. And we need more of that in business. That, that um, why am I such a fan of of you guys, it is the red team thinking. Um, we can go back, we can look at mission command, we can look at our frags tactic, we can go back in history and we can think about ultimately the the innovation in military back in the 1800s and forwards is is then um, is then fascinating because we observe that um, I, I'm being chased. Um, we observe that the the military innovation in in leadership theory there is right. what is what I think is a is a quite a foundational capability that the industry is still catching on to. Uh -huh. um, and, and Nationwide Building Society is headquartered in the West country of the UK. So actually commissioned and non-commissioned officers, UK, are coming into Nationwide as a second career. I learned my best stuff. My, my best scrum master was non-commissioned officer, um, military police, Germany. But she was incredible because she, the disciplines of scrum uh, allied with pre previous entire life um, and a life that I, can, right. I can't even really imagine. I can read Team of Teams. I could read Turn the Ship Around. I could, but I can't picture her life. And actually, incredible Scrum Master because of the combination of that, that, that discipline and rigor of military training with the confidence and, and, and care in uncertainty. So I, for me, that, that's absolutely at the heart of, of this is the, the, the red team thinking, mission command, alpha tactic, um, back briefing. You know, all, all of these things sit as the military innovation that drives now industries going, Oh, look at agile, look at this. Like, yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's just, it's bringing in things that, that have been with us for some time. 
Awesome. Let's take a quick break. And when we come back, we'll dive a bit deeper into that. Stay tuned. Hey, folks, Bryce here. If you're listening to this and you're liking what you're hearing and you're wondering, am I a red team thinker? We have an easy way for you to find out. Just go to the show notes, click on the link there to our free assessment to find out if you are a red team thinker and what you can do to think more effectively, to lead more effectively, and to make better decisions faster in your complex world. Like I said, the link is in the show notes, or you can simply go to our website, redteamthinking.com. Check it out. I can't wait to see how you score. So welcome back. Before the break, we were talking about how leadership executives today are struggling with being comfortable with ambiguity, with being comfortable with being uncomfortable in this VUCA, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous and hyper-connected world that we now live in. And you know, we were discussing during the break, when you're uncomfortable with things, what we say is go and ask internally. You've got great people working for you. They will have the answers. Ask them. But what we tend to see is executives outsourcing their thinking to big consultancies like the one you're working with now, Richard. And, and there's, a, there's, a, there's a good handful of them out there who are doing this. Why do you think they're doing that? And how are you seeing that from your side of the house now where you are with a shift from being in the business to now being on the other side, poacher term gamekeeper, yeah. or is it the other way around? <laughs> I can't tell, but, but I've, done, I've, I've gone back, yeah. forth, back, forth, right? So the, um, I'll start with, but why did I come back? So I came back because actually the journey with Nationwide, that sense of um, really reconnecting internally within Nationwide on design, product, engineering, leadership, um, learning from military, uh, I felt that the, the, the business transformation journey in Nationwide as an industry player seeking to balance resilience and agility, seeking to be comfortable with uncertainty, I felt that those learnings were really applicable to many organizations, many industries internationally, because the VUCA world is, is the world we live in. So I was really excited about the opportunity to come back and, and share the Nationwide learnings and my own personal sort of my personal growth, like all the scars and all the damage and all the, the, the sort of things we got wrong and want to do again. Uh, the opportunity in consulting is to be able to support organizations to achieve their ambition. The, the, the opportunity to go and wrestle with these wicked problems. Crucially for me, I, I will really struggle with the idea that I'm going to take a problem away, solve it and give it back. Solve that that's the uh, on a personal values thing. I'm, I'm, I'm excited and passionate about the opportunity to support organizations um, who, who, who wants to almost rediscover and, and reintroduce um, their in-house mm -hmm. belief in themselves. And I, 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 don't, I don't have a problem with the sense of scaffolding. I, am, I, I, I support the idea that scaffolding and um, consulting in the sense of consulting and coaching on, right, you, you know, what can we explore? What can we, what can we test? Where, where can we improve through um, experimentation? What I observe with with my favorite client conversations is that that sense mm -hmm. that um, yeah, leaders within organizations who who really want to themselves individually, collectively with a sort of guiding coalition type thing, move their organization um, into and embrace willingly a future with increased uncertainty and an, and a need for creativity, curiosity, courage. Those are the organizations that actually, if they work well with, whether it's sm small niche boutique topics and or larger players, but larger players who don't, who don't assume they can do everything to the very best, but, but also larger players with a degree of humility to, who do appreciate that if you want to talk about red team thinking, this is where red team thinking is, is done. So I, I think that's actually, that's a real opportunity for those clients. W what I observe in, in parallel though is, is organizations who are riven with fear and organizations yeah. who turn to a, um, I don't want to have to try and make a decision. I want to just procure something that, 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 that moves me forward in a way that I can feel like I've, I've sort of, I've, I've placed the need for widget X or, or process introduction Y or, because that's what, that's where I feel my safety levels allow me to get to. And so I think there, the, the, the conversation is how do, we, 
how do we unlock the brave? You know, how do we unlock that? That again, the vulnerability, the humility, the bravery, the curiosity. How do you unlock that? You rather than um, inflict um, a, a particular answer. How do we actually explore the problem area? How do we use things like sense making? How do we think about things like warning mapping as well? The, the idea that we can we can be clear on what is now commodity and should be outsourced, whether that be rented as a service or whether that be outsourced to a third party. What's the difference between that versus what's genesis or what's exploratory? These these are the things that sort of trying to reintroduce concepts that help folk um, at, at senior leadership levels um, wrestle back control of their own destiny rather than I'm fearful, therefore I'm going to, I'm going to mm-hmm. sort of press ahead with outsourcing the thinking. Well, you know, this is so interesting because, you know, the, the, the kind of scaffolding model that you talked about can be in a, in my mind, you know, an appropriate use of consulting, if you will, um, because you're helping your, 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 it, that is, that is being like a fitness coach. You know, you're helping your client develop the muscles that they need to be able to do this on their own, ideally. The problem is, is that too much of, of, of what I see as consulting is what you described it very aptly, Richard, as fear-based. You know, I'll give you a perfect example. And, and I don't mind naming names because I, you know, to me, these guys are public enemy number one for most businesses. You know, McKinsey, you know, makes a great living doing the work that companies are already doing themselves and should be doing themselves. And, um, you know, I'll give you an example, a, a company that we worked with. Um, one of the the people that went through one of our programs developed an amazing strategy to take the company into a new business area using using the red team thinking tools that, that he learned. And he developed uh, a pitch for the board, you know, for senior leadership based on 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 all of that, sold it to, to the CEO. And this this would, would have taken the company into an entirely new, very pr- potentially lucrative business. And the CEO took it to the board and the board said, that's really amazing. That's really interesting. But you know, we've never done this before. So let's let's have McKinsey look at it. And right there you get what you just talked about, Richard. Right there's the, there's two things. It's it's fear and it's a lack of confidence and trust in your own team, which is a which is just a horrible thing, I think. So what happened? They paid McKinsey a couple of million dollars. McKinsey took 18 months to study the problem, which involved interviewing every member of this guy's team, came back 18 months later with a report saying, this is a brilliant strategy. This is exactly what you should do. And he said, great, too late. Two of our competitors have already done it. This was a first mover strategy. Now it's too late. And they, and, and they, and they said, well, no, we, we, we could catch up. And he said, no, you can't. This was a first mover strategy. And the company made a half-hearted effort to try to, to come in as, as the third player in this space and piddled away another, you know, hundred million dollars. And, you know, and, and so what did they get? They, they spent, they, they lost the opportunity. They lost millions of dollars, both, you know, on, on a failed experiment after the fact to, and they paid McKinsey a couple million dollars to tell them what they already knew. They got nothing out of it. And you see that stuff happening every single day. And I would submit that it's even worse than the money that they lose. Because guess what? What did that guy do? He quit six months later. Because he's like, you know what? There's no point. There's no point working for a company that, you know, when I come up with the best idea of my life, my career that I've been working on, this like he, he had had this idea over a decade before at a different company and had been refining it in his mind. He's like, what's the point? You know, if I if I next time I, I come up with a brilliant idea, they're just going to give it to McKinsey to, to second guess and fritter it away again. I'm going to speak. Um, I'll give two, 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 two views on this. So I learned a huge amount from McKinsey in the nationwide context, actually. Um, and I, I can speak about it, right? So, so McKinsey and, um, and Sapien were my partners um, in digital transformation. And for me, actually, I really learned business acumen and, and an appreciation for um, 
ultimately a major business case for digital transformation with support and learning directly from the McKinsey colleagues. And, and actually um, now quite good friends of mine individually are McKinsey folk who um, worked tirelessly to make some things happen that actually I don't think at the time we could have done, or at that time we couldn't have done ourselves. Um, and maybe even ever actually the, the, the particular capabilities. And, and I think that um, in, in some ways the, the example you give where um, you know, a third party is, is asked to come in. And I, I think for me, that piece where the third party was asked to come in because um, of a, of a, a lack of self-confidence in the organization's own people from leadership, that I agree is something that, that, that we must seek to improve. We must get organizations in a place where either cost, cost to learn through experimentation is, is low enough that actually people feel more confident investing in experimentation and investing in, in exploration so that, that even if they don't feel confident, they've got mechanisms to gain confidence. Lean startup, basically, how do I gain confidence? Um, those skills, I, but um, expertise, where expertise is, is valuable and expertise helps either unlock new potential or, or um, yeah, co coach, fitness coach. Um, I, I have observed industry side that any of the organizations we, we, we can badge or label, it's a bit like capital A agile, it's that sort of, is it all bad? No, it's not all bad by any stretch, but, but the mechanics and the, the backdrop for, for what makes these things, what, what are they measured on, how, how are they successful, um, drives, incentivizes and rewards certain approaches and behaviors that, that yeah, that then they're not the best necessarily all the time, but, but those individuals, there are some incredibly capable individuals and there are committed individuals wanting to do the right thing. And I, I for me, measurement systems um, also wrapped in procurement, procurement regalia that, that is fit for a different era. Um, and ultimately this question about trust and, and lowering the cost of learning, lowering the cost of, of learning through experimentation so that you can start to build this, this internal muscle may well need scaffolding, both to introduce an experimentation engine and to reintroduce a culture of trust and belief in learning through doing, you know, whichever of the Greek philosophers, they weren't wrong with learning by doing that. That's the sort of making a theory and testing a theory. Right. I think a lot of this goes back to <clears throat> The origins, you know, the word consultancy, and you mentioned it's about expertise, isn't it? You know, the true consultancy brought expertise that wasn't available, and you've used the word scaffolding. Scaffolding is there to create enablement, so the individual who brought you in can do it themselves, and that's where the quality that you know. And I had this as well, working with multiple consultancies, working with Lloyd's. You've seen this, and you see those individuals who come in to do and enable that for you. But then the flip side, what we often see at much bigger levels as well, is the dependency that's created. Yeah. And to me, that's yeah. the real yin and the yang, or the, 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 the polarization of this is consultancies should come in and enable organizations where they need them and then upskill accordingly and then step away rather than what they see is the long-term, you know, we call it crack cocaine consultancy where they want that dependency on you. And they can't ever walk away because the minute you threaten to be, okay, our contract's up, we're walking away. And those fearful executives go, you can't go, stay. We need you to do, to do what? To do what your people should be doing by now. And therefore, why aren't they? And I think the conversation we were having about the NEDs during the break, let, let's talk a bit more about that because there's this very different perspective. And Ellie Cloak, one of our colleagues says, what you see is where you sit. And likewise, how you behave is often driven by where you sit. And I think like you, I've seen the very different perspective from NEDs, these non-executive directors whose job is there to challenge, come from a very different angle than they're often colleagues that they're working with in the boardroom to do the same thing. Yeah, I, I was saying, I, I observed in, in a recent conversation with, with, with non-executives, uh, I, I, it's a breath of fresh air. The, the, the non-executives um, ask provocative questions not not to to look clever in front of their peers but but to genuinely seek to um you know, test test the organization test test their own thinking in service of improving you, you know, again the, the organization's performance the organization's longevity and i i sort of uh, the ability whether it then be with consulting organizations or whether it be with with non-executives to 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 take yourself out of the operational hurly-burly 
and ask probing questions in a in a safe to explore environment, I have really appreciated that that sense of of um, yeah, it, it, real real comfort with asking questions that maybe in a different setting the same individuals would would feel that their operational responsibilities preclude them from from asking. So I, I for me that that's that's one um, weapon in large organizations arsenals is, is the opportunity to engage your non-executives and, and really bring that, that that diverse perspective that ability to step out from the operational running of the business and and, and give appropriate question and challenge um, I also observe that non-executives increasingly kind of um, overtly interested in technology and innovation uh, and because that sort of lower lower cost the barriers to entry are now lower there's uh, technology and innovation is, is around us everywhere um, non-executives much, much more comfortable now engaging in technological innovation uh, as as provocation um, everything from from business model reinvention to market disruption enabled by uh, some of these some of these topics that maybe four five six years ago wouldn't have been wouldn't have been a topic of conversation at all or wouldn't, wouldn't have been a, um, a color in the paint paint palette being used in a, in a particular you know, context. So I, I, I'm very much enjoying that at the moment. It's interesting that you say that, Richard, because, you know, it's, it's unfortunate. Um, this kind of became a casualty of COVID for us, but, uh, but prior to the pandemic, we were, we were uh, beginning to do some work with, um, what was the organization, Marcus, in the UK, the, the NET yeah, organization? Net. Yeah. Was it, I, I was, uh, I came over to London, had some meetings with folks, and we were talking about you know, there was a real interest in the leadership of this organization um, that that is the kind of national organization for non-executive directors in the UK to to bring red team thinking training into their capability because it, 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 it people saw that this was a valuable skill for for board members to have for directors to have to be able to constructively but but forcefully you know kind of ask the tough questions of senior leadership that they should be asking and you know this is something in the United States that that I've been pitching very strongly as well because I think that and we've seen this unfortunately in the past decade there's been some really graphic examples of of boards failing in their responsibility to shareholders to investors to employees to 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 every stakeholder theranos uh being the, the probably the, the 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 most graphic example of this um the proper bo- role of a board of directors or of 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 you know uh uh non-executive directors in the UK is to is to is to provide that critical thinking function i would submit in addition to just regular oversight, to ask the tough questions of leadership, to challenge leadership, because they're the only ones who can in many organizations. And, and not in an adversarial way, but in a constructive way, in a collegial way. And too often, I think people accept board memberships because they get an extra 50 grand in their pocket a year for showing up once a month, you know, and at a nice hotel you know, or something and uh, getting, you know, some, some nice meals and a round of golf out of it. And, and they're not doing what they should be doing, which is really looking over the shoulder of senior leadership, not second guessing senior leadership, but looking over the shoulder of le- senior leadership and saying, what else have you looked at? Tell me why this is the best course of action. Have you thought about how this plan could fail? You know, what happens if the market changes? And, and, and good board members do that. But but lazy board members don't. And, and oftentimes people don't do it because they don't know how to do it. And so I think that, that, that applied critical thinking, it should be a core competency yeah. of non-executive directors. So then I guess the, the, the challenge for, for, for us societally, um, the, the ability to say, okay, should that form of critical thinking and, and articulate measured questioning be limited to either niche consulting organizations with experts and or non-executives with training and or in this world w- wisdom of the crowds how do we harness that 
that inside an organization? How, how do we actually create a, a, a sort of an appropriate melting pot that still has absolute rigor, discipline, um, again, back to, back to the military, that, that sense of you know, we, we absolutely know how we interoperate within, within the context of our setup, but actually on, maneuver, on maneuvers out, out, out doing the work we do, we are much more um, a team and a team where actually the most junior person may well have the brightest idea because they're not mired. They've not been calcified. They've not been, they've, they've, been, they've not lost the, 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 the wonder and the, the ability to ask the new question. Maybe, maybe in, in that sense, actually new person, they're, they're freer. And I think that right. uh, the opportunity to unlock the same degree of, of, of potential in an organization is, is, is ultimately what, what I was enjoying in, in the nationwide context, that, that ability to say, okay, the non-execs with the senior leaders, but why not the teams with the senior leaders? What, what, what's required of senior leaders and what's required of teams to have that, that form of, of readiness to ask a question and readiness to receive a question in the spirit it's intended. It's in the spirit of improvement. It's in the spirit of education. It's not in the spirit of challenge or, or, or you know, disobedience. So the, the answer to the question, I think, is yes and yes. <laughs> and, and what I mean is you, you need both. You know, the appropriate, the, 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 the goal for every organization should be to have the psychological safety and the applied critical thinking capability at every level of decision making to enable distributed decision making, to enable off tracks tactic, whatever you want to call yeah. it, at the same time as having a senior, you know, board that is doing its job of providing a forum for asking the 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 the, the tough questions before final decisions are made. Um, and one of those questions should be, what does your team say? Yeah. What do the folks at the coalface say? Brilliant. What do the folks on the factory floor say? That, I think, is the solution. Yeah. I, I, I would, uh, you know, and isn't that an organization we'd want to work in? You know, isn't exactly. that somewhere where, where you, would, exactly. you would then feel proud to be your organizationally somewhere that, that welcomed, welcomed questioning, welcomed... Um, a desire for for learning and, and improvement, um, and had the the controls in place that said that this is actually how we 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 do with the same approaches, pre mortem style approaches um, in the boardroom, uh, and yep. yeah, that that is you know, moving forwards. So those are the organisations that, that of any size, scale, industry, they're the ones that we would observe in particularly in this environment in this in this world of of yesterday today and tomorrow maybe maybe you know 50 100 years back less required but 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 now critical thinking distributed decision making confidence to be able to and safety to be able to ask the questions um confidence to be diverse of background diverse of thought diverse of ethnicity and 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 then it, to be able to bring yourself in um those are organizations you'd want to work with and work in and I think ultimately they're also the there organizations you, go, you buy from, right? You know, that, that sort of belief in, right. in, in yeah. yeah. There you go, folks. We've solved the problem. <laughs> Just do it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Richard. It's been such a pleasure chatting really with you. Was. Excellent to see you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jens. And, and again, um, keep up the excellent work and um, congratulations for, for all those folks who are working with you so far. The Red Team Thinking idea is fantastic. It's such an important part of, of an organization's kit bag for today and tomorrow. 